<laughs> Blowing farmyard ferals. Tim shoots them and gamekeeper Roy gives them the once over. Can you play Happy Birthday? <laughs> <laughs> Lord of the Prance. The latest field tester is out and David gets an earful from the hunters in the high seat for the hard of hearing. Have you got the foamies in? What? <laughs> Scots on the march as rural workers prepare to protest over the Scottish Government's anti-hunting agenda, we speak to the organisers. Membership offer, we have a ridgeline monsoon jacket worth more than £150 to give away. Plus the story of zinc bullets with Andrew Venables. We have news, we have hunting YouTube, welcome to Field Sports Britain. We love a pest problem. Why? Because we know how to deal with it. Here, stealth is the key. This farm is home to stud horses and ponies, so we need a gentle while effective approach. We're having an interesting morning, I think. We've got a, a local chap who's got some problems. First, we've got um, some feral pigeons in one of his barns, so we've been asked to pop into his farm and hopefully get a few of those. I, I despise feral pigeons. They make a mess all over my tractors, all over the corn in the barn, so we had to keep them down. So it's a pest control thing. They keep on multiplying, they keep on coming back to the barn. So it's one of those things on a farm we have to do. St. David's Day. It's St. David's Day. Oh my goodness, David. Have oh, you bought My you... mother used to make me go to school with a daffodil stuck to me. It was traumatic. <laughs> it was very traumatic. <laughs> well, I mean, where are the cream cakes? Yeah, it's, it's your day, so you should be bringing the, the, the cream cakes. Cream cakes? Yes, no, yes. Lava bread. Lava, lava bread. bread, oh, in your days you had your tough, <laughs> did you? <laughs> I can hear them. Tim only unboxed this rifle at the weekend. His previous day state in 177 was flat shooting, so he is expecting the same. However, to be sure, he did what Johnny Muston explains in the latest field tester. He mapped the trajectory. Yes, it's very interesting. After watching Johnny's piece, I thought I'd, I'd try that actually. So about 10 metres, and yesterday it was shooting about half an inch low, uh, out to 30 metres at zero, and then I took it beyond that. And with this rifle, and the way it's perhaps designed, we'll perhaps go into the features later on, is even at 45 yards, which is quite a long way, I think, for a, for a 177. You know, my drop was about, I think, about an inch. And I actually learned an awful lot by doing that. So I think it's actually a very simple exercise. It takes you about half an hour, and you, you know exactly what the actual rifle's capable of doing. So an interesting exercise. I would guarantee anybody with a rifle have a go, and you will learn something. Okay. Roy retrieves the dropped pigeons and explains how he knows that this one is a youngster. It hasn't got any wattles. They, they, they go grey and, mm. and wider. I think very soft. Soft beak. As they get older, the beak garden. Same with pheasantry. Mm. So how old do you think that might be? That, I should think that's probably three, four months old. Okay. So, yeah. Do they breed all year then? Yeah, without shadow of a doubt they breed all year. This is an old one. She's got grey wattles. Yeah. It's ma'am. So why are you blowing onto it? Because it, this time of year they'll have a brood patch, so if you blow, they'll be, get a bald patch here on the things. So that's how you tell male and female. Yeah, sure. I'd done the that. <laughs> if you blow man. here, yeah. a female's got a brood patch where the the feathers just part and mm. you get a ball patch. Yeah. And that's what keeps the eggs warm. They don't warm them on the on the feathers. I have no idea about that. That's Can a you show me a brood patch, please? Well, hang on a minute. <laughs> this is where you end up just plucking one. <laughs> 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 
Beth and Mel. Resuscitation. It's not April the 1st, is it? Oh. What's that called? Brood patch. Yep. Yeah. Wow. Holy spread, see that's female. That's male. No brood patch. See, can you play happy birthday? <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever blown a pigeon? I've never, I've never. Yeah, I was about to say, actually, I've blown on a few breasts, but I've, I've never, I've, I've never blown on a pigeon. <laughs> That's why. <what I, laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> Moving on swiftly, and it looks like our work here is done for the moment as the pigeons have finally understood our reason for being here. Yeah, it's quite satisfying because you just know you're doing some good. And also it's a disease issue as well. The whole thing, they're just, they're feral. And I just do not like these pigeons. So uh, yeah, it's the thing we do. We mop up every so often and get rid of them. And also with such a, you know, a high quality rifle as well, it makes it so much easier. It makes a huge difference. For more information about the Day State range, including the Wolverine R, go to daystate.com. Thank you, Tim and Roy, for a lesson in bird biology. Now, here's someone with a PhD for duh. It's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. If you're offered a Webley Nemesis combo air rifle from a private seller, it may be stolen. Thieves are thought to be using a WhatsApp group to sell 600 of the newly launched Nemesis air guns that they took from a lorry in a lay-by. The guns were in transit last week from Southampton to Webley's warehouse in the Midlands when thieves swiped them. Since then, the stolen air guns have been surfacing on social media. One new owner of a Nemesis combo walked into a Highland Outdoors dealer asking to buy CO2 for it. Staff passed his details to police. The easiest way to spot the stolen guns is that they come fitted with a Webley scope and moderator. A falconer in Scotland has launched a petition against a government law aiming to protect mountain hares. Barry Blyther of Elite Falconry says the legislation effectively makes activities with eagles up in mountains illegal at odds with UNESCO, which recognises falconry as an activity of cultural human heritage. If upheld, birds could be consigned to aviaries for the rest of their long lives. The Mountain Hare Bill was sneaked into Parliament at the last minute of a session last year, denying MSPs the chance to debate it properly or hear expert opinions. The petition means MSPs will discuss the issue after the Scottish elections in May. Barry says the Hare Law means he could break the law if he allowed his eagle to behave like an eagle. People will say, go up into the mountains and fly anyway, just don't hunt game. It's an eagle. That's what it's up there doing. It doesn't fly for fun. It flies because it's just a, a, a method of movement that enables it to catch game. So I'll be flying my eagle around on a lovely estate one day, a hare moves, it falls out the sky, catches it. Even if I didn't flush it and it wasn't intentional, I'm going to jail, metaphorically. I've just committed a crime under the Wildlife and Countryside Act. Anglers in Kent have won their battle against a wildlife trust that wanted to kick them off a reserve. We highlighted Bromley and District Angling Society's cause a couple of weeks ago. Kent Wildlife Trust demanded the group stop angling at Seven Oaks Wildlife Reserve, but gave no reason why, other than it was part of its Wilder Kent plans, which include revamping its visitor centre and installing a number plate recognition car park system. After a meeting with BDAS and the Angling Trust, Kent Wildlife Trust agreed to allow anglers to stay. Dennis Puttock of BDAS said the group looked forward to working closely with the KWT to forge a long-term plan for the benefit of nature conservation. The League Against Cruel Sports is celebrating survey results it claims shows that most people in Northern Ireland want hunting with dogs banned. LAC says more than 18,000 people, or 78% of those who filled in its Survey Monkey poll, say they support a ban. 
the Countryside Alliance Ireland points out that the survey is open to anyone around the world, meaning it's inviting people from other countries to influence Northern Ireland's policies. There is no way of properly identifying those who completed the survey, the result of which was the opposite of two separate independent polls which showed widespread support for hunting. The Alliance says the impact of a ban would go beyond hunting and affect gun dog owners, farmers and wildlife managers. People from Australia, we had people in America, we had somebody picked it up and shared it in Munich, we had somebody in the Netherlands. So is it really representing the views of the people of Northern Ireland? You know, th these people are not going to be affected by this. It's going to be our rural communities. It's going to be our vets. It's going to be our huntsmen. It's going to be um, the feed people. It's going to be um, the point to point racing. All these people will now be facing an uncertainty. Will they be able to continue? Game Meet March is back. The movement to encourage shooters and hunters to clear out their freezers and eat meat in March promotes the benefit of game and raises awareness of a sustainable, environmentally friendly source of meat. Go to Game Meat March on Instagram for recipes and discounts. Thanks to Steve Kearney for the reminder. Carrie Simons has launched a bid to rescue a lion from an Iranian zoo. The Asiatic lion in Tehran Zoo has a respiratory disease and Miss Simon says the only way to save it is to rescue the animal. She's unclear what rescuing means in this case, as two lion cubs have died in her own zoo, Port Lim in Kent, since early January. Denmark has rejected plans by the EU to ban hunting and shooting in protected areas. The European Commission lumped field sports with mining in its 2030 biodiversity strategy, which aims to make 30% of the EU protected in nine years' time. This has outraged hunters and fishers. Denmark's Environment Minister Lee Wormelin reassured them by saying the EC does not have the authority to ban hunting on Danish soil. Shooters in Sweden have already been up in arms about an EU lead ban that would not allow them to carry lead rifle ammunition near water. More Germans are turning to hunting for their food as an alternative to plastic-wrapped supermarket meat. Paranoia about suggestions the source of coronavirus was meat from markets is making people take food sourcing into their own hands, with a relatively large increase in hunting licence applications. The National Hunting Federation says 19,000 people applied for permits last year and 80% were successful, twice as many as 10 years ago. Last week, we highlighted the problem of too many bears in Slovakia. This time, it's the USA. According to the National Geographic, America's grizzly population is out of control. The bears have been expanding their range in Montana, Idaho and Wyoming to places they haven't been seen in more than 100 years. And encounters with humans are increasing. Last summer saw a spike in attacks, especially as inexperienced campers flooded the great outdoors to escape coronavirus lockdowns. In the 1970s, state grizzly populations were in their hundreds. Now Alaska alone has 30,000. The Fish and Wildlife Service has twice in the past 13 years tried to take the species off the protected list, but failed due to lawsuits from conservation groups. Australia is cracking down on fallow deer numbers. In a move that angers local sports hunters, Parks Victoria is closing off Australian national parks so it can massacre the animals in order to save native wildlife. Meanwhile, farmers say they're shooting thousands of non-native deer a year with little impact as hundreds continue to descend on their paddocks every night. They're calling for trials of a feed container that allows deer access while excluding native animals, which they can load with 1080 poison. Shooters plan to use the census to get extra protection for hunting and shooting sports. Launched in 2003, the Free Church of Country Sports is back. After vegans successfully persuaded the courts in England that their lifestyle choice is a religion, a Facebook group has resurrected the Free Church of Country Sports. If they can get 8,000 people to name that as their religion on the 2021 census, they'll be able to claim the same protections for hunting and shooting sports as other religions. On, on Action Against Antis, we've, there's about 10 or 12, well, there's 12 of us that are in an admin group. And, uh, and one of the guys said, what about this church of, well, he said the free church of field sports at the time. So what, what, and I said, what about it? He said, well, why don't we get that up and running again? 
And finally, the UK has had its fair share of freezing winter weather, but nothing has prompted people to travel by ice. Instagram user Outdoor Channel TV posted this cool video of an angler making his way downstream in style. Thanks to Per Holmseth for that one. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Next, a message from Zeiss. Before we get to this week's membership offer, we have a good news story. Two weeks ago, we covered the silly decision by Kent Wildlife Trust to kick anglers off its lakes in Seven Oaks. Now, thanks to our coverage and sending our film to the right people, ITV covered it. Then the Wildlife Trust saw sense and reversed the decision. This is exactly the sort of thing we can do as the noisiest field sports friendly media platform in the country. And this is why we're asking you to join up to the Field Sports Nation. Media is where we can make a difference. Most of the national media is not anti-shooting. It's just that the antis are far better at giving them stories. That makes journalists' lives easier. We can do that too. So please join today and you'll be in with a chance to win a Ridgeline jacket and you won't miss out on all the other cool stuff we have coming up from stalking to shooting lessons. Next, you've heard of copper bullets. You may have heard of brass bullets. Andrew Venables tells the story of zinc in bullets. It ain't ballistic gel, it won't tell you much, but watch closely when we put two rounds into a steel target. The first one is lead. The second one is a non-toxic metal we have only touched on. It's zinc, powdered, compressed, and now sold as a varmint round. Here's firearms expert Andrew Venables to tell the story of zinc in ammunition. This is actually just a small sample I could get together in the time available of other than lead bullets. Just a quick sort of historical thing. If you have a look at these you can see they're different colours. You can see that's more of the pure copper type bullet. This is more of the bronze gilding metal type bullet. The design of these is to give virtually 100% weight retention but some people prefer lead bullets because they fragment and you get fragments you might get a quicker kill technically on the animal. When we look at this little board here, we see that there's an odd bullet. There's an odd case here. And this we can describe as the start of the zinc thing. This is a copper jacket, which was wrapped around a zinc bullet with a frangible front end. And on impact, the copper jacket and the front end of the bullet split into multiple fragments, leaving this little zinc barrel to give a little bit more penetration. Let's get back to the main plot. If we look at these rounds, and we take the one in the middle. This is actually the Barnes Varmint grenade, the bullet that was zinc compressed powder with a copper jacket on it. And when this hits anything with a lot of liquid in it, like flesh, it absolutely dumps all the energy and blows up. Great, wouldn't that be great for killing deer? No, because it dumps its energy terribly quickly. If you shot a fallow buck on the shoulder with one of these, even in the correct caliber, like 243, it would probably just blow up on the skin and the outside of the, collar, of, the, of the shoulder blade and not penetrate. This is a varmint bullet for shooting predators and varmints. That's, but that's just the start of the zinc story. These little things here, happen to be in 223, are again compressed zinc bullets. You couldn't call it full metal jacket because there isn't a jacket on it. They use this in shooting cinemas in Europe. It's designed to just shoot basically at a very close range target and produce a hole in the screen so that you can film it. Actually, I've tested these out to 100 mm meters. They're quite accurate. If we look over here, these are zinc powdered core with a copper jacket. The end two, it's just compressed powdered zinc. All right, zinc and copper actually, this one mixed together. 
quite an unusual bullet because it really all falls apart on impact. They're for use in military situations when you don't want full shoot through or you're in an indoor shooting range situation where you don't want lead particles flying around in the air. They use the pistol version of those for air marshals. You don't want to shoot a hole through the side of the plane whilst you're trying to shoot the suicide bomber in the plane. Brands you probably heard of, Fiocchi, again, this is a leadless full metal jacket military style round and it's a zinc inner. It's very accurate. We've shot this out to 800 metres, it shoots extremely well. On to the hunting thing. If you want alternative choices to the copper or mono metal bullets that we've been seeing as the apparent first drive of lead free, zinc expanding front end of the bullet down to that rim that you can see there and then the rear of the bullet is designed to stay as a barrel penetrating through and give you that extra penetration for an exit for the blood trail you may want to follow to where it's gone. This is the end of a project which has been lasting at least 130 years. In terms of bullets and the development, once we'd finished shooting muskets and we'd invented rifling and we started trying to drive lead balls or lead mini bullets as they were called more quickly, as soon as we got over 1500 feet per second, the lead fouling was disastrous, it stripped the rifling and it wasn't working. So we had to wrap our lead bullets in copper. Okay, this is, this is the jacket of the bullet. Sometimes it was copper, sometimes it was gilding metal. In the Second World War, they ran out of all sorts of stuff like lead. They actually had steel bullets with a little bit of tombac or nickel wash on them. All sorts of things have been fired, but this is really old technology. Why are we still using it now? Why do we imagine there's nothing better than a soft lead core wrapped in copper, which as everybody wants flatter shooting, faster, harder hitting rifles are becoming increasingly less reliable. A company called Nosler in the United States in 1947 thought, hey, we can make a better bullet than this. We're gonna make a bullet with a separation in the jacket. RWS H mantle, the same kind of thing, the Nosler partition bullet. And they created a bullet with a jacket a partition in the middle, a hard, higher antimony based lead core locked in at the bottom with the jacket being bent in a bit there and at the front they kept that traditional. They kept it a soft point with soft lead and when it hits an animal this lot blows up partly, fragments and you normally end up with just that much left, this part of the bullet actually exiting from the animal. All this lot has blown up, fragmented. In about 1985, the Barnes Bullet Company and Fred Barnes perfected a system of actually effectively soldering the lead into the copper, so like a bonded core bullet. Even those bonded core bullets, the magnum calibers that were coming out then, were making them fail. They were blowing up. He thought, why don't we just do away with the lead altogether? It was done to give us a bullet that could be driven at much higher velocities, retain almost all of its weight after expanding on impact, and you've seen plenty of images of the expanded copper type bullets or the gilding metal type bullets. So back in 1990, 
these came onto the market and over a period of 10 years, they were further developed. They're continually developing them now and they're getting better and better. The patents have expired on this principal technology. Many companies are making this type of bullet now. They also make bullets like this, which are designed to fragment here so that you get these things like blades breaking off and forming three or four or five separate fragments. Zinc bullets first hit the market in 2010. The front of the bullet is a powdered zinc recompressed together and when it hits the animal, whether it's a hollow point or a ballistic tip, this front end actually fragments quite spectacularly and can give, with all good bullets they need to be put in the right place, but can give vast kills as these can. But if you're not in quite the right place, you may still get a fast kill with this because there's fragments coming off it. You're the base of it is a hardened zinc. And when this front end has effectively blown off, this back end will carry on penetrating and generally give you an exit wound. So you're getting the best of all the worlds really. So we have so much choice now. When I started shooting 45, 50 years ago, my choice was a copper bullet with some lead stuffed in the middle. Now look at it, it's brilliant. For more about WMS Firearms Training, go to wmsfirearmstraining.com. Thank you, Mr. Venables. Now, Andrew has of course been involved with Field Tester, our kit review show. We've got Mutt and Jeff here. This month, we look at hearing protection with Roy and Tim, who should have been wearing it from a young age. We compare passive with active kit using all sorts of techniques. Plus, David gets punished for a career of noisy stalking. Also in the show, Johnny Muston maps the difference in trajectories between 2.2 and 177 air gun pellets. And with so much online shopping going on, when is a large a 2XL or even a medium? We speak to Jonathan McIntyre, a military tailor, about sizing and the difference between high street brands. There's a link to Field Tester in the description below. And if there are any real Morris dancers out there, please give our novice dancer a strictly come Morrising score out of 10. Right, this month the Scottish Gamekeepers Association has organised a protest against the Scottish Government. We ask them why. For decades. Scottish Gamekeepers Association Chairman Alex Hogg doesn't mince words when it comes to the treatment of Scotland's field sports community. When people said that the Scottish Parliament was to be formed, I thought this is brilliant. It will give us a chance to deal with local problems. It'll give us a chance to deal with the politicians and see them on their doorstep rather than heading to Westminster. But over the years it's become very greeny, very anti-shooting. There's attack after attack after attack on our profession and way of life. And it, we just feel like we've been kicked from pillar to post. The Scottish National Party relies on minority Greens for its parliamentary majority, which has led it to back some poorly thought out policies just to keep its grip on power. It's just anti-estates. It's the same with the hairs, protect the white hairs. That'll be the demise of the white hair. In 10 years time, the white hair will be gone. The only place that has got white hairs is grouse moors. We just looked at a film the other week with Abernethy, not a white hair on it. You know, all the s &H ground, we offered a thousand pound to anybody, any of the organisations that could produce a white hair. None of them have come forward. And that's what makes us angry. We're the guys on the ground that have the hairs. The laws to protect mountain hares are also affecting falconers. The effect of the legislation on hares, I think, is going to be negative anyway. A bird of prey, especially something like an eagle that's trained to fly the way ours do, which is from high on the soar. So we get high up into the mountains. We're looking for a windward facing, a really steep windward facing slope. You release the eagle into the wind. The eagle goes up on the wind, X number of thousands of feet. And we work on the ground with the dogs trying to flush the quarry under the eagle. That method of successfully hunting game and her connection with me is ingrained over 20 years. If you take that away from her, what am I going to do with that eagle? 
tether it to a perch for 30 years, throw it in an ivory to do nothing for 30 years. So it's a joke for hair conservation. More are going to die. That is without getting into this thing about disease and so on. Further than that, what about the repercussions to all these captive bred birds of prey that are no longer going to be allowed to fly properly? What do we do with them? How about their welfare? The government's deer policy is being scrutinised after it opened up the hind season. The government turned around and said they didn't change the rules, but if, if the rules hadn't, hadn't been changed, we weren't aware of it. So yes, very controversially, they decided to open the hind season the beginning of September rather than the middle of October. They shot almost 1,300 deer, females and dependent offspring in a month. That compares to period, the same period the previous year, 2019, they shot 170 and 165, that's 350. So that's a, a huge increase. Well, you know, September, you've got high um, vegetation cover, how they managed to achieve that, were some of them shot in the open hill where they weren't doing any damage to trees. I suspect, we suspect a lot of them were probably shot at night. The Greens are promoting this year's election as the rewilding election. On this north end of the estate, Ben, that was bought over by two guys from Yorkshire and they planted 1.3 million trees and the curlews and lapwings are gone now. The peat's been ploughed up. Everything has been destroyed and it's all for grant money. And we need to try and stop that happening on areas where you've got your waders. And that's where the grouse come in. My impression is that the government are trying to sicken the landowners by, you know, shooting more and more deer or banning hair shooting as they've tried to do, or licensing hair shooting, trying to ban grouse. They're basically, they're trying to cripple the countryside and then, you know, landowners will maybe say, well, we've had enough, it's not viable anymore. And... Um, on you go, have it and plant trees. You've got to ask yourself this because these two guys who Yorkshire are going to sell as soon as they can and turn their money over. They don't care about the nature. That's what worries me. Once it's planted with Sidka spruce, you've got nature just leaves you like, you know, like snow off a dike. Alex is planning an online protest on the 14th of March 2021. He's hoping people will wake up to the damage being done by bad laws targeting rural communities. And we've had support from plumbers through to heart surgeons. It, it would amaze you the amount of letters that we've had in the office from that broad range of people. Even guys down in south, if you guys want to support us, drop us a letter, drop us a Facebook thing, because lots of guys from the South come up to Scotland to stalk or grouse shoot or whatever. Yeah, the SGA and the landowners, um, definitely, we need to align ourselves with them. We rely on them for their goodwill to be allowed onto their land, even if it's a commercial arrangement and we're paying, which we do 99.9% .9 of the time. Um, it still remains the fact that they've got to welcome us there to enable us to have our sport. Um, and further than that, if it wasn't for what these guys are doing, the volume of game which is possible because of the way the land is managed, wouldn't be there um, to allow us to have exciting, interesting, worthwhile sport. Be very careful where we place our vote. I think that's the most important thing to go over to you today is we must be careful where we vote. Otherwise, we could the keeper in world could be finished in 10 years. That's a call to action. If you can take part in the 14th of March protest, please email info at scottishgamekeepers.co.uk and the SGA will tell you how you can help and what actions you can take. Thank you, Ben, and all the best to the SGA for this. It does feel at the moment like the central belt is against the Highlands. Now to the wider world of hunting and shooting outside Scotland. It's Hunting YouTube.
This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. Let's start small. Small, but always great. Cumbrian ratters have a new film out. A day need you ask of smoke dogs ratting and shooting. Quieter next. The Hunting Ireland channel sends me this fallow deer shooting film using a custom Hauer 1500. While Germany brought us Hunter Brothers, Belgium has produced hunting cousins. In this film, they are after wild boar on a driven day. The lads from Swedish channel Smelens Jagana are out beaver hunting in Delana County central Sweden. The Swedes sensibly worked out that having beavers is fine as long as you are allowed to shoot them. In the UK we are apparently struggling with that idea. Thanks to Mark Corney who sends me this from Australia. Last week we reported how there's a plague of mice in states such as New South Wales and Queensland. Well, Edge of the Outback Channel has turned it to his sporting advantage using a 2-2 mounted with a Thermion XQ50 thermal rifle scope. Coyote culture from the Cheyenne River predator hunters next. In this film they are calling them on snowy ground in South Dakota. Buchanan Hunt Season 3 Episode 8 is out with Crocs Buffalo and all kinds of hunting made and starring members of the Zimbabwean Buchanan family. And finally, a stump-stirring speech from Paul Stones in South Africa for a Dallas Safari Club virtual fundraiser. And he makes good points about how it's up to us, the conservation hunters, to look after what remains of the world's wildernesses. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the I symbol top right or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top eight, email me the link, charlie at Fieldsports Channel. TV. Well, that's it for this week. If you haven't done so already, please whiz over to our website, fieldsportschannel.tv, where you can click like us on Facebook and on Instagram. You can follow us on Twitter, subscribe to us on YouTube, and of course, pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show. Field Sports Britain is at 7 pm UK time every Wednesday. This has been Field Sports Britain. Good hunting, good shooting, good fishing, and goodbye. <laughs>